Today I'm going to talk about our next chapter, Rape and Sexual Assault. Uh, before delving into the cases and some of the history and cultural background here, uh, I want to offer a few contextual uh, ideas that are important to recognize both in these lectures and in our class discussions. Uh, all the crimes that we look at this semester affect uh, portions of our population and often in very different ways. Um, but rape and sexual assault is perhaps unique uh, among the topics that we uh, look at in detail uh, in that there are certainly people uh, in our class uh, who themselves have been directly victims of rape and sexual assault and uh, almost everyone, if not everyone, uh, has known someone close to them. Uh, and so rape and sexual assault occupies this uh, relatively uh, unique area uh, that it's both a very serious crime, uh, one that has substantial effects on our society and individuals within it, but it also occurs at a fairly high frequency, right? Unlike our last chapter, murder, which is perhaps our most serious crime, at least of the core crimes, uh, but is rare, uh, even though the United States has a higher uh, homicide rate than other nations. Murder itself is extremely rare, and even negligent homicide and manslaughter are infrequent events. But the simple fact is rape uh, and sexual assault occur with incredible frequency. Um, I think it's fair to say that at the low end, uh, one in every five women uh, will uh, be uh, raped or sexually assaulted in their life, according to the CDC and other research in this area. Um, and uh, that's particularly true when they're between the ages of 18 and 25, which is sort of the, the core zone of targeting, which in fact many people in this room uh, or I guess watching this, uh, are in that age range uh, or recently were. And so I mention all this because of this connection uh, that is sometimes far more significant and direct uh, to people here. It's even more important than normal to be respectful and understanding of your classmates and recognizing that um, the, the experience of being sexually assaulted or raped is uh, one that carries a lot of different cultural baggage, uh, isolation, sometimes trauma. And we're going to talk about these dynamics through the course of this chapter, uh, but it's significant to you know, get that out of the way, and we'll talk a little bit more in our class session about um, how we talk about these things itself is, is a significant part of uh, being able to engage them intellectually uh, and um, talking in a constructive manner about them. Um, and I also will use language choices that, uh, or make language choices, I should say, uh, that may not be uh, to everyone's satisfaction throughout this, this section. So in particular, I use the phrase rape victim. Um, there are some people uh, who have been raped who prefer the label survivor. Sometimes I use victim survivor, but uh, I use the word victim uh, for two reasons. One is uh, it's one that, in fact, many people who have been raped prefer. Uh, Andrea Dworkin being a, a, perhaps the, the most prominent example, she said it was the most accurate word. It was the truest to describe the event, um, but others as well. Uh, but also a big theme of my work in this area, and I do do a lot of scholarly work here, is that we should treat rape victims the same way we treat other crime victims. Uh, in other words, uh, we'll talk a lot about how there are some unusual aspects to rape law that make us uh, question victims far more than we see in any other context. And so by using the word victim, I seek to unite them with a word that we use in a very different legalistic sense in law uh, by saying they should be treated with the same level of uh, belief and the same level of respect that, say, somebody who has been been battered, somebody who's been assaulted, uh, the survivors of a family um, uh, for a murder victim. Uh, and so victim is, is a particular uh, label here. And I apologize that it's not, you know, everyone will, you know, think that that's the proper rhetorical choice. But, you know, I'm trying to give you some context for uh, my decision uh, there. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there is a lot of sensitivity to some of the, the discussions we have about rape and sexual assault. But it's all the more important that we do have these discussions despite that. Uh, one of the themes of my scholarship that I, I 
you know, we won't talk as much about it here in class, but if you take a sex crimes class with me, uh, you'll learn about is that we are, as a society, very much afraid to talk about sexual violence and sexual abuse, and that often reinforces the dynamics that empower uh, sexual abusers. And so, um, yeah, I think it's important for us to, you know, so we can have these conversations that are absolutely essential, I think, for us to have, both as future lawyers and as, as future uh, citizens and, and people participating in a society, um, we need to be able to think through uh, what is going on in, in this area because we do have a high rate of sexual violence. But let's get some less controversial terminology out of the way. Uh, the chapter itself is called Rape and Sexual Assault, even though we are really going to be focused on what many of you would think is rape, which is penetrative acts um, as defined uh, criminal non consent I'm sorry, they're non-consensual and defined as criminal. Um, and uh, sexual assault, though, is included in the label because, in fact, many jurisdictions don't use the word rape in their statutes. So, for example, New Jersey just has different degrees of sexual assault uh, from the penetrative acts that are non-consensual and forcible all the way down to, say, uh, forms of groping. So the terminology is, you know, uh, varies by jurisdiction. And so uh, we'll use the word rape uh, for the most part, and some of our cases will use sexual assault, but you'll notice that the, the focus of of the case facts themselves is going to be on these non-consensual penetrative uh, encounters uh, between people um, that are defined as criminal uh, in our law. And so uh, let's start uh, here um, in this discussion uh, not by looking at the modern era, which is the emphasis of a large segment of this course, but one of the two reasons that I think it's important to look at rape and sexual assault is that it's the, the area under which uh, there's probably been the most legal change in the modern time frame. Um, as you note from the excerpt from an article I wrote, although it's, you know, that many people have said this, it's not saying unique to me, it's just a, a descriptive history. Uh, rape law was radically changed in the 70s and 80s. And so this is an area where we get to see um, real uh, um, differences and how they, our society changes its perspective on uh, what the law should be and then how that law gets applied after a social and legal transformation. Uh, this is quite different than, say, our last chapter, murder. If you remember the Keeler case, um, the, one of the issues for both the majority and the dissent, but ultimately the majority said we can't interpret uh, this homicide murder statute unless we go back to uh, the 1870 statute, then the 1850 statute, which is really uh, um, applying the rules that were in place in around 1650 in England. Uh, that's very different, right? That's a law that's had a, a you know thread that goes throughout time time, very little change, certainly in the, the way the statute's written, even if its application is shifted. Uh, but here we do see very big differences, and we're going to talk about those. And that actually bleeds into the second reason that I think this is uh, an important um, crime to look at in greater detail um, beyond its social ramifications I began with, uh, which is this is an area where you see the law in the books differing from the law as applied. And you will see this throughout your law school experience to varying degrees in different courses, that culture and law are sometimes not at the same place, right? What the law defines as criminal and what society is willing to accept in application that law can differ. And this is an important part of learning to be a lawyer and learning to participate in the legal system is recognizing that the statutory language or even the case language is not always reflective of what's really going on. And so you learn to develop a more critical eye, one that notices patterns, one that sees uh, maybe instances where this area of law is operating in a way that, that's not well described by your conventional outlook or theories, often very formalistic, right? Apply this doctrine, this outcome should occur. And so um, this is also why it's right here at the end of our substantive crimes, because it's pushing you to, to think a little more broadly and not just get fixated on this is the laws written, these are the facts as they occurred, this is what the outcome can be, because that formulaic process breaks down 
in, in many areas of law to varying degrees, and rape and sexual assault is a big one. So we need to start with this sort of historical look to understand uh, where uh, the U.S. started um, at least in you know from the ninth, the twentieth century onward, um, and so I could have picked any number of cases from this era. In fact, I've even changed the case I've used here in my teaching. But Minnesota v. Cowing reflects uh, several important dynamics of the law before the reform movement. Um, you know, one thing that is is notable um, is uh, how much uh, the court focuses on the conduct of the victim in this case. Right. There are all sorts of questions about what she did and didn't do. Um, there's very little discussion of the conduct of the defendant. And this itself should already start getting your mind thinking, huh, that, that's odd, right? It's victims, you know, we use the phrase putting the victim on trial, but there is a literal truth to that in, in this area where it's not as though she's being charged, but her statements and her testimony are what the court's concerned with. And the defendant's conduct almost falls by the wayside, even though the, the facts here, you know, might instantly, we think, raise some serious concerns. I mean, the age of the defendant, versus the age of the victim is an enormous disparity. The limited contact they had before this, um, the, the worries that um, the, the victim you know, expresses in her testimony shows a different attitude about her um, ability and rights to uh, say no. But ultimately here, uh, we did have a case where there's a prosecution and a conviction. Um, so it, it did go through the process there. And yet, uh, the majority here is going to reverse that conviction, and they, um, you know, really think that this is an instance where uh, the defendant did no criminal wrong. Um, now, a new trial is ordered, but it's under instructions that make it extremely difficult for this case uh, to be retried. And if you look at the court, you know, they say uh, that the victim here had no specific act of resistance, uh, testified as she was carried to the couch. Uh, they say not only is she not shown to have used or tried to use her hands, but there is no testimony she used or tried to use her body, legs, or any ordinary means of reprisal. Neither the victim nor the perpetrator appear to have borne any bruise or mark or resulting from the struggle. There is confused testimony that one of the skirts was slightly torn, but no evidence that the clothing had been touched or torn. Um, nor does the record show any threats or intimidation on the part of the defendant. And so a lot of this is, is really unusual. Right? You could never imagine the same paragraph being written in, say, a theft case. We wouldn't have an instance where we'd say, well, sure, the defendant, I mean, the victim says they were mugged in a dark alley, but the fact that the clothes were ripped doesn't mean that it was ripped by the defendant. Right? This is after we have a jury verdict. The fact should be construed in favor of the government. But we would also wouldn't say, well, they didn't do the ordinary means of resistance. They didn't hold the wallet away and resist their body. What is being applied here is a resistance requirement, one that, that was part of rape law um, explicitly uh, during this time and uh, in some form has been explicit in our statutes into the, the modern times, and we'll talk about that in a bit when we go through some cases. Uh, it, this point, you know, we have what's called the utmost resistance requirement, meaning that it would not be considered rape unless the victim resisted to their dying breath. They put their life in jeopardy. This is quite an incredible um, um, aspect of law. No other crime do we say a victim has an obligation to resist, an obligation to fight back and risk their life, not if they're being robbed, right? not if they're about to be murdered, not if they're being assaulted. We don't uh, put burdens on victims to try and make something criminal that otherwise would not be. It also paints a very strange picture of consent, and this is something that has not varied. Right? It puts particularly women or girls um, in a defensive posture where the default rule is they are consenting to sex at all times with all people, and only if they resist do they create a non-consensual encounter. If they give no sign or overture that, that they are interested, that doesn't, that's not required for it to be raped. And here, the, the burden on the victim is, is very, very high. And we'll talk about some of the history of why this is, right? You know, it has to do with where rape law comes from. It has to come with the notion that uh, rape law was, was largely viewed as a crime against men uh, because uh, either there was their wife or a 
person who was a potential future wife uh, who was being affected. And since women were viewed as property in the early era of rape law, um, this whole way of thinking pervaded uh, um, the, the, the criminalization of the conduct. And yet, even after we decide, well, women are not property, that's uh, awful and wrong, um, lots of residual aspects of that belief and of those legal rules remain in our rape law to this day. And so this case, you know, is, I think, hopefully you understand, is, is a bad outcome and one that we, we, should, we should think is wrong. Um, even the dissent here um, doesn't exactly kick and scream and yell, this is an injustice, it's horror. They're just like, eh, maybe we should have deferred to the jury here, right? And that's basically it. And, and so the split vote here is not uh, very significant in itself. But one piece that's really important to recognize in this case that you will see even in our modern cases it's, it's the emphasis on facts, right? So we've looked at a lot of cases already this semester. And sure, there's sometimes where the court does have to go through the facts, sometimes because they're very complicated, like our, our bank fraud, mortgage fraud conspiracy. Um, but sometimes they can be summed up in a mere paragraph, because if you're going to construe the facts in favor of the jury verdict or the fact finder's uh, um, finding, uh, then you just need to go through one version of the facts. Uh, every now and then, though, we've had to do more in certain cases to try and get a complete picture and story. But a feature of rape cases, and one that we need to keep our eye on, is how often the factual discussion dominates the opinions, and importantly, you'll see courts willing to relitigate the facts. Right? That's what's going on here. The jury already heard all this, and as the dissent notes, they had a, a chance to decide who was more credible. But the majority is like, well, we think, you know, that this, this story doesn't really add up. We, we, we think there's better arguments here for the defense. And so at the end of the day, an appellate court is relitigating the fact more so than we see in other areas. It definitely has happened in, in, you know, some cases we see, and we've seen this criticism, but it is a feature that happens all over. So Minnesota v. Cowan is not just about identifying history in this area. It's also providing us a baseline of comparison. I want you to think as you go through all the cases throughout this chapter, is this really different than what happened in Minnesota v. County? Because if it isn't, that should raise an alarm, right? If we think, oh no, our modern cases are dressing up the language different, but they're still implementing the same basic rules in Minnesota v. County, that's a problem, right? Or we can see things that have changed, right? This is an area where our law has improved and seems to be applied in a better fashion. And we'll see both of those uh, throughout uh, this unit. Okay, so this is sort of our baseline, our history, Minnesota v. Cowing. Uh, but I want to want to step back to, oh, I edited the slide, but it still ended up with the N a little goofy there. I don't know why when I put it up here. Maybe the screen perspective is a little different. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is a little cultural background because one of the things I mentioned at the beginning here is this is an area of law where culture and the law in the book's are not aligned, right? They are in different places. So to help understand that, you need to understand, well, where's our culture at? What is it thinking in terms? And so um, this is actually my work in theory in here, and it's part of a book project I'm working on. So, you, you know, this is not necessarily universal. Uh, the labels I use here are my own creation. Uh, so you should feel free to take them with whatever grade of salt uh, you think you need here. Um, but um, I divide basically the modern American uh, uh, cultural dynamic regarding rape uh, into three basic time periods. Uh, cowing in, is ignorance, the period of, of time when we just really don't believe sexual violence is a big concern. Um, the resistance requirement puts such an onus on victims that it's just, it, it's almost never prosecuted. Arrests are almost never made. And when we do get convictions, they're almost always overturned. To the degree they are supported, it's it's in a very particular situation which raises other problems, which is when black men are accused of raping white women, we see not just convictions, but in fact, uh, uh, the death penalty being applied, or uh, if they were found not guilty, we see extrajudicial lynchings. So there is one area, but that that's still a, a product of ignorance, right? A period where we're not taking sexual assault seriously unless it happens to coincide with social racism. So uh, that's the period of ignorance. Then by the, you know, basically the 1970s, we start getting what I call the period of recognition, uh, which means we realize that maybe our law and maybe our culture is not in the right place, but you know, the solutions and the approach we're going to take to it is not necessarily um, the most thought out or uh, helpful. Um, it's going to be filled with a mixed bag of uh, ideas and cultural dynamics, and so we'll, we'll look at examples of that. 
And now I'd say we're actually in a period that I call uh, ubiquity, which means that throughout our culture, there's actually discussions of sexual violence, often as plots on TV shows and movies. Um, it frequently is, is part of the, the college experience, training. But that ubiquity doesn't mean we're talking about things appropriately or in a constructive manner. It just means that it's part of our, our social milieu and uh, part of what modern society um, uh, it can talk about. But we talk about it in very particular ways. Uh, so let's look at some examples here. So um, to a cultural ignorance period, and, and perhaps the thread I use to teach this, and I also included in my book project, uh, to help unite these periods and, and give a, a greater clarification, is Pepe Le Pew. Uh, Pepe Le Pew was a skunk created in the 1940s by Warner Brothers. Um, Every episode consists of him um, basically sexually assaulting a cat. And I know that might sound strange, but it's not really an inaccurate description. We're going to watch a video in class. I'm going to skip over it in this lecture because, as we saw with the previous video, that doesn't the sound doesn't translate well. So uh, we'll watch it in class. But the cat conveniently gets a white stripe down her back, and so Peppy thinks it's a skunk. He pins her down. He tries to forcibly kiss her. He you know, does all sorts of things. Now, of course, there's not penetrative acts, but there is assaults going on here. And this is a cartoon for kids. And Pepe has remained a character till this modern day. So he, this, this early Pepe from the 1940s is emblematic of ignorance, right? Why would you show a, a skunk that sexually assaults a cat to kids? It's just, it, it's, it's a level of ignorance here. And I'm sure many of you watched this, children, and I hope after you see the video, you'll look at it a little differently. You'll realize that things were there uh, that, that you didn't know were there. Um, but it also, you see it in other media. So perhaps a, a very prominent, famous example is Baby It's Cold Outside. Um, still played in any department store you go to during the holidays. Um, you know, it's, it has some less than ideal interrelationships between a man and a woman. Um, in the way it's traditionally sung, there have been some gender reversals, um, like Zoe Deschanel's group did one. Uh, but generally, it's a man pleading with a woman to stay. Uh, and he's telling her it's cold outside, so stay here. Uh, and, you know, whatever you think of that, that that's you know, not out of the norm of behavior um, and, and in our um, music and the way things are described. But the middle, one of the middle verses is a little odd. So really, I better scurry. Beautiful, please don't hurry. But maybe just half a drink more. Pour some records on while I pour. The neighbors might faint. Maybe it's bad out there. Say what's in this drink? Which is an odd line, right? Some people think this might be our first reference to a roofie um, in sort of pop culture. And so, yeah, why, why is there suddenly uh, a worry that he's, uh, you know, puts on there a drink to help keep her uh, motivated to, uh, to stay? Um, so as I said, we will watch uh, the old Pepe clips to show what I call the pursuit model of romance, this notion that men must chase women and women must uh, resist. And the obligation is put on them and men should be encouraged to be aggressive and not take no for an answer. This is part of our culture from this period of ignorance that's, you know, we'll talk about how much of it stays through today, but it's undoubtedly there in the old uh, Pepe Le Pew. So continuing to use Pepe uh, as a sort of uh, launching point or a totem for this, this story, um, we enter a period of cultural recognition. So in the 60s and 70s, somebody points out to Warner Brothers, hey, you kind of got a rape a skunk on your hands. Maybe you shouldn't do that. Um, and so at this point, uh, Warner Brothers adopts a solution that's not that unusual. It might sound odd. Uh, they have the cat fall in love with Pepe. So instead of we're having her be a resistor, she now loves him. And we'll just ignore all those times that he pinned her down and did things. She actually, there's one episode, she throws herself off a cliff trying to commit suicide um, to escape him. I mean, it's not, it's not subtle. Um, it's also at this moment that they finally give her a name. Up until this point, she was called the cat. Uh, she becomes Penelope. And so they fall in love. So yeah, this is where you recognize the problem, but your solution is a little imperfect. Uh, we see other examples of this, including some very well-meaning ones, like uh, Jodie Foster's movie The Accused. The Accused tells a story of a woman who reports a rape, um, but she'd been smoking marijuana and drinking at a bar, and so she wasn't really believed. And in the, the movie, um, the prosecutor originally pleads out the rapist to a lesser charge, but after Jodie Foster pushes her and the woman has sort of a raising of her consciousness, they go and prosecute um, the uh, people who watch this occur in the bar, the spectators. Um, and so in the end, you get a sense that justice, although imperfect, is done. 
the problem with this story is is it was taken from a real event, uh, the rape of Big Dan's Tavern in uh, New England. And uh, in the real story, no one was prosecuted or convicted, right? Hollywood had to take a tragic tale of uh, the failure of our criminal justice system and give it a Hollywood ending. And that recognizes the problem but doesn't really tell the story that more accurately reflects uh, reality. Okay, and then by the 90s, we start entering what I call the period of ubiquity. This is when rape and sexual assault move from hushed discussions or, you know, this notion that's impolite to being part of our, our um, pop culture. It's often a plot device in to detrimental ways uh, for women characters. Lots of action movies use this where a man seeks revenge because uh, the woman was raped. It's, it's you know, it's, it's overused as sort of a character element. Um, but it also, it, you know, there's some studies about soap operas, how it went from basically being the only plot line for many of the women there. Uh, Law & Order SVU, of course, becomes a show that seems like it will never end and be on forever. Um, and so returning to our, our Pepe Le Pew story, uh, Warner Brothers, for whatever reason, decides, you know, uh, let's introduce a new skunk, in this case, Fifi Le Pew, and we will let Pepe mentor. Uh, Fifi is less discriminant uh, than uh, Pepe, and so she makes unwanted advances and sexually assaults um, a variety of, of different uh, um, characters. So you see uh, Porky Pig here, previously um, a cat. And so this is, you know, they, I think they thought, well, if, if maybe if the skunk is female, uh, this will be more comic. Um, both of these characters have remained part of the staple. Uh, Pepe is supposed to be part of uh, the next movie coming out from Warner Brothers. And so, yeah, it's, you know, it's, 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 I meant, you know, the story isn't meant to be the totality of our culture, but it's to give you something you know already, something you might be familiar with or watch as a child, and see that there, there are tropes, there are narratives built into it that might not be the healthiest for us uh, to approach uh, sex and uh, um, consent about. Uh, you see uh, Robin Thicke here, um, Blurred Lines is an example of a song that's got some really problematic lyrics that show, you know, sort of an awareness of this this consent issue, but then refers to it as a blurred line. And then we, by the time we get to T.I.'s verse, it's um, pretty aggressive. He talks about ripping her ass in two and so forth. Um, so, yeah, we, we there, there's now a, a greater comfort level with uh, these sorts of topics, but the way we talk about them and even the way shows like SVU talk about them distill things to a very simple story. And in SVU, we, get, you know, we have a very different uh, um, story than the real world, where, in fact, most uh, victims are not believed. Most cases are not prosecuted, and we rarely get convictions. So it's a very different type of story in this cultural ubiquity area. So I give you this cultural dynamic so that you can think of it in comparison to our law and to see maybe what's reflected in our case because if this truly is an instance where law and culture are mismatched, we need to understand why. So one of the things that definitely has changed since the Cowing case is our laws are now gender neutral for rape of an adult. Uh, at the time of Cowing, um, most states, if not all of them, uh, only recognized rape if it was a man uh, raping a woman or girl. And this went back to the notion of um, uh, it being a property crime against men. So other permutations uh, were not recognized. That is no longer true with rape of an adult. You notice I, I'm saying the word adult here because, in fact, uh, the Supreme Court held in the 1970s in the Michael M. case that statutory rape, where it is considered rape by virtue of one person being underage and potentially the difference in age of exceeding uh, um, the amount uh, that's statutorily required, um, those statutes do not have to be gender neutral. And we'll talk about why that is uh, at the end of this chapter when we get to the statutory rape section. So that was an innovation that definitely stuck. It was implemented in the 70s and 80s for those states that hadn't already uh, changed their law in this area. Uh, but beyond that, we have three basic requirements uh, or elements of uh, uh, rape statutes. Um, now, you'll notice I'm not talking about the NPC versus common law here. Uh, in truth, the, the real world's a bit of a mess here. But the NPC itself um, is uh, antiquated because it was adopted during a period before the rape law reform movement. So it doesn't make sense, in my mind, to go back to the original NPC and see how it's written. Instead, we should just look at modern rape law, which is generally reflective of the common law approach as modified by the rape law reform movement. In fact, uh, I will be meeting um, 
tomorrow uh, when we first discuss this uh, topic uh, at uh, with a virtual media, the ALI, because uh, the model penal code is, whoops, I have to put it up this way to the camera, is uh, now on our 10th draft trying to reconsider uh, how the MPC defines rape and how the law should apply in this area. And so I can talk a little bit about uh, that as well. And so when I say there's three elements here, um, I'm being across both approaches, uh, but we have some trickiness. First of all, sub-jurisdictions, about half, only have two of these elements, uh, the Sex Act and the non-consent requirement. And then there's an interrelationship between the force and non-consent requirement that we'll get to. Um, so it's not, you know, we, we can say there's two or three elements, but even that doesn't fully capture um, how force and non-consent sometimes interrelate. So the easiest requirement, but not one that's, you know, always obvious um, to students who are new to this, is the Sex Act requirement. At one time, it was referred to as carnal knowledge, so it's the traditional phrase, which meant that it had to be vaginal penetration and, in some cases, to ejaculation. Uh, and so uh, that was a very limited definition, but it fit with the notions that, that um, early uh, courts and legislatures had about what was wrong about rape. Uh, and so it's been broadened since then. But there are some differences, right? For example, some jurisdictions recognize what we call digital penetration, penetration by a finger. Uh, others do not is rape. Some recognize um, penetration by an inanimate object. Others do not. Um, and so the definition of what is a sex act is still not uh, complete. Um, some jurisdictions do not recognize uh, non-penetrative acts as a sex act. In fact, that's quite common. And so in our second case uh, that we look at um, in the, the act requirements here, uh, a case that involves two women, there is a penetrative act, but there isn't necessarily one in many cases involving two women or in other uh, sexual contact situations. So the focus on penetration is itself uh, sometimes obfuscates what we might think of as non-consensual sexual contact. Okay, so our big requirement, um, the one that we're you know going to focus on the most, not just in act requirements where we have two cases, but when we get to mens rea, is non-consent. Um, and so we have two cases to look at here that that show the way non-consent cases are often adjudicated and um, the difficulty in bringing them. Um, and so. Both of these cases, um, you know, are uh, show the fact or the, the pattern that I identified in Cowie, which is an extensive discussion of the facts. In fact, I've edited down the second case again and again and again, uh, and it's still quite lengthy. I try not to exclude any of the really germane core facts, but the court spent enormous time talking about what the victim says and what the defendant says, which is itself unusual. And, and I hope you see it as unusual by this point in the semester, because normally what the defendant says we don't care about at the appellate level if it contradicts what anyone else says. So if the victim testified, if other eyewitnesses testified as to certain things, that should be the way the appellate court treats all the facts because you have to defer to the fact finder. Now, the first case does use some standards in language you might be unusual because it involves a juvenile delinquency um, hearing. But in fact, it's it's replicating the criminal law here. All the standards uh, have their counterpart. So like the manifest weight of evidence is really just our reasonable juror standard. You should defer, uh, in this case, to the reasonable judge. Um, and so, yeah, th there is some... You know, you might think that this is a significant part, but no, it's it's ultimately the same substantive law, and the procedures are nearly identical in all cases. So, what is going on in this case? Um, everyone agrees uh, that um, the you know, so that we do have initials referring to people because uh, they are underage here. Uh, we have ZB, uh, his. Uh, you know, testified by JJ uh, that she was forced into the men's bathroom so that she would give oral sex to him. Um, you know, JJ tells her friends but didn't report the incident. Um, children in schools are often very reluctant to report these things because, in fact, they often end up being the ones punished uh, for violating rules against, say, having sex in school or just getting in trouble with parents and other authority figures. Um, but uh, she also, um, you know, eventually does come forward a month later, which, you know, is what sort of gets the ball rolling from our uh, legal standpoint. And it's because she had told her boyfriend who insisted that she reported it. And she said during the time that it occurred, she repeatedly screamed no, and she tried to get us away from the situation but was unable to. Um, you can see from JJ, uh, you know, is, is tr you know, from her testimony, she's trying to get out of this situation without 
escalating the violence, right? This 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 bad thing has happened to her, this thing that, that she she didn't want to happen. So she, according to gives the phone number so that she would be safe to leave the bathroom, um, right? She wants to get out of there. Um, JJ's friend corroborates all this information, right? That this was what she stated at the time. And these are contemporaneous views because she does tell the friend right afterwards, right? Well before this boyfriend enters the picture. Um, and so ultimately, ZB is adjudicated in juvenile hearing and uh, found that he has committed one act of rape. Uh, but ultimately, the court here reverses uh, this finding, and they do so because they don't find JJ's statements credible. And this itself is, as I said, remarkable, right? So the, from the court's holding or, or findings, JJ's testimony contained numerous discrepancies and was it simply at times not believable. In addition, her testimony was consistently impeached with evidence other than ZB's own testimony. Because the only issue in this case was consent, it was critical to the state's case that JJ provide credible testimony. Because she did not do so, ZB's argument that this adjudication delinquency is against the manifest weight of evidence has merit. This itself is a remarkable statement. I mean, even if you believe the truth of it, um, this is not what appellate courts should be doing because we believe that the fact finders, in this case a judge, but often a jurors, are by far in the best position to assess credibility because some things um, – uh, about credibility are not captured in a transcript, right? If somebody appears nervous, if they are vacillating, if their emotions are overwhelming them in a way that make we think they're credible, there's a lot of things that are only captured in the moment of the trial, or so our law believes and so our evidence rules believe. And so the court here, though, is saying there's discrepancies. Well, the, the tri those were all heard in the original hearing, right? Um, if they are discrepancies, right? The impeachment was all heard. And so the only time the court should be reversing here, the appellate court should be reversing, is if there's just clear error, if there's just absolutely no way um, the facts could be right. Instead, what the court's saying is, is we prefer one story over the other, right? We prefer the story of ZB because we find JJ's story is contradicted. And this is um, a problematic. But it gets even more worrisome when you look at the reasons why uh, the court uh, does not believe J.J. So, for example, the fact that she had contact and communication with Z.B. afterwards um, and often appeared friendly with him. This is extremely common um, among rape victims. Not just those, say, in the school setting where you're often trapped with uh, the person who had assaulted you because that creates different dynamics for you to not you know, make a scene, not create trouble, not um, risk further danger, whatever the rationalization is, those exist in school. But there are also uh, many people who are raped uh, try to, because of trauma or even without trauma, try to make sense of what happened and often communicating with the perpetrator is part of that process. And any, you know, any expert in this area will tell you this is a frequent response. And yet the court here sees this as an absolute clear sign that she was lying. Right? That's their conclusion. She wasn't telling the truth. And so these things that the court is fixated on, and we can talk about more if you, you know, in class, um, these are not actually things that contradict her story about being raped. They're just things that they don't think are, are uh, part of what a, we sometimes refer to as the perfect rape victim would do. What they think this, this, a, a person would do in that situation, which is usually ill-informed, not based on actual research or evidence, uh, but also a standard that almost no one can meet. Um, it's a very shifting standard that perfect victims are almost never a real thing. And you can always find, um, you know, errors or in hindsight things that the defend, I mean, the victim did that we think they should have done differently. But we shouldn't care as much about the victim. Credibility does matter, but their conduct and what they do is is really irrelevant. But the credibility basis here for overturning the the adjudication, it's problematic. And this is, as you know, I said, not unusual. And so this is sort of our, our first case scenario. It's also clear that this. Um, uh, you know, what's going on here is what we call a negative consent model. Um, so there's two schools of, of thought here that you sometimes see referred to, particularly about college campuses, affirmative and negative consent. And there's this example of Antioch College that I'll elaborate on in class. But the idea is affirmative consent, yes, means yes. Negative consent, no, means no. Now, these are not the only way we can view consent. And as, as we'll talk about, I don't think they're actually that um, as different as we think. 
Uh, but the Novi No model is what's largely built into our law and our jury instructions. And uh, in those cases, it means that we put the onus on the victim to say no. And this is also anomalous, right? Some people are like, oh, affirmative consent, that's crazy, that will criminalize all sex. Affirmative consent is more or less a rule in, in other areas as well, right? If you see somebody's laptop unattended on a table and they've gone to the bathroom and you take it, we don't say, oh, well, you're not guilty of theft because they never objected. No, we have an affirmative consent rule. You have to have permission to take somebody's property. It's not explicit in the law, but it's built into our norms about property and how they transfer. And so, yeah, you can't just steal something and say, well, they never said no. And that's, you know, permissible. No, we use affirmative consent for assault, battery, assuming, you know, our jurisdictions that recognize those theft. Anywhere consent is in play, we don't, you know, say, well, they didn't object to being punched in the face, so I just assumed they wanted to start a boxing match. Yet when it comes to rape, that's the default rule, right? It's that everyone's consenting all the time to all sex with everyone else. And that itself should make you say, huh, why is our law built around that? That's not a, a truthful assumption. That's not how, we, we don't think that, that we are consenting to all the time, but it's the way the law works here. So this is uh, ZB and, and you know, it, it starts to, to show this, this dynamic. But even if you're worried about a fair consent, we'll talk a little bit more about in class. Um, but I wanna get to our, our second case here, which is Zimbo. Now Zimbo is um, among our gender patterns of sort of binary sexes, but there is a lot of non-binary um, sex identification in the world of rape. People who are transgender are targeted at a much higher rate than any other group for sexual violence. Um, but we, we rarely see uh, a woman rapey woman. It just doesn't happen as much. The overwhelming majority of our perpetrators are men, uh, and that includes assaulting uh, women and other men and uh, transgendered uh, non-binary uh, sexes. So um, this is an unusual case in that regard, uh, but it's also really unusual at a, at a different level and one that makes it an effective teaching case, which is our victim is uh, deaf, right? They cannot communicate verbally with the same clarity. And why is this important? Well, it means we get an evidentiary record that's almost unheard of in, in any person-to-person -person case. We get letters. We get the victim and the defendant communicating back and forth about the events that happened. Um, this helps us, you know, separate the no normal problem, or I guess avoid the normal problem uh, that occurs in these cases of he said, she said, or in this case, she said, she said. Uh, because now we have evidence of what each of them thought and not self-serving statements at uh, trial or before the police. And in fact here, we have a lot of statements made by our defendant that seem to be quite incriminating. Um, and so one thing I want you to do when we're, we're looking at this case and talking about it in class is make sure you're separating your act requirement mens rea, because that's not something the court does well here, and in fact, it's not something many courts do well. The act requirement for consent is merely that a person did not consent. That's it, right? The mens rea is whether or not the defendant believed, under whatever standard we're going to use, and we're talking about different standards, that there was consent. These are separate things, just like all our other crimes. And so the act requirement is just based on the victim's desire to not have this sexual encounter. Now, the negative consent and affirmative consent models can complicate this. So one way to think of it is basically mind and body, you know, sort of that sort of separation, right? The, the idea here is what's in the victim's mind is actually what governs consent. Um, and uh, the mens rea is uh, often interpreted uh, by the defendant based on the body, which is what nonverbal or verbal communication uh, made by the victim. And so this is one distinction that sometimes helps students in this practice, because as I said, it's something that courts regularly uh, uh, mess up. And there's these intertwining of elements here. Um, you know, this, this notion of force and how it's used, which is our next, you know, um, big act requirement, force and non-consent interrelate, right? If force is used, then it doesn't matter if our victim says, well, okay, right? If you've been threatened with a gun, that okay is not consensual. It's a product of force. But there's also issues like in this case where the act of, of the sex act itself seems to be forcible, right? It causes abrasions, it causes wounds, and courts will ignore that force. That's sometimes called um, 
uh, intrinsic force, means it's part of the sex act, whereas they want to focus on extrinsic force. So we're going to get in this, but I, these are these are concepts that are important in several cases of this chapter. That This is the first case where you might notice them. We'll get into more depth. Um, the Illinois statute here is pretty basic uh, in terms of incorporating force and non-consent. It says force or threat of force means the use of force or violence or threat of force of violence, including but not limited to you know, the, the threat and the, the superior strength and size of the, the defendant, physical restraint and physical confinement. Okay, whoops, I clicked the wrong screen there. Um, so let's look at our, our testimony. Was the touching without your consent? No, no, I did not consent to that. I did not consent to that. So at the appellate level, this is pretty strong evidence we have non-consent, right? We, you know, if we interpret the facts in favor of the lower fact finder, you got to believe that that basic uh, part of things. But if you start blurring it with mens rea, well, then things get more complicated. But then we get letters from our defendant. I do love you. I care for you. I'm worried about you. I know you said not to. So that's that's a little vague, right? It could be, I know you said not to do the sex act, or it could be not to worry about you. I'll do it anyway. My feelings about what I've done are mixed. I should, I should die for what I've done. Okay, well, now that's a little more incriminating. That seems to recognize that what she did was wrongful. Maybe not legally wrongful, but saying you should die usually implies legal wrongfulness. I've done wrong, and it will never be forgiven or forgotten. I need to straight out. I, I need to straighten out my scary side, medications aside. Maybe I need to get rid of the scary side of me. I know I have one. I'm sorry. Please let me know if you're going to send me to jail. Well, this seems like a clear recognition that a, that a line has been crossed. That's a legal one, right? Being sent to jail and the scary side. These are all. Whoops, I didn't mean to go to the next slide. There are lots of other communications here, but when you combine these two pieces of evidence, right, on the stand, our victim says, "No, I didn't consent." And then uh, we have letters that basically are admissions of guilt. It's hard to imagine we get a reversal, and yet we do. And so I'm just going to leave it there, right? We're going to talk in class about why, because it's, this is not obvious. I think the court makes a lot of mistakes, and I, I want us to go through them together rather than just lecturing on them you hear. So this has been a long lecture because it's introduction to a big section, and it includes a couple act requirements and the history as well. Um, but this will cover us for two days of class. So next time, uh, we'll move into the last act requirement, force, which we've only touched upon in this case.